Hi, hi Giancarlo, how are you? Fine, thank you. So uh, we, how are you? Yeah, we have a great case, hopefully, that's going to highlight all what we talked about just now. I want to introduce Dr. Karthik Guja, my, my associate director here at Sinai, um, who's uh, helping us with this case. So, so at this stage, I'm, I'm going to have Dr. Uh, Farhan Majid present the case. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. So this is a 48-year-old male with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Uh, the patient presents with worsening one-block lifestyle limiting left lower extremity uh, claudication for the last few weeks. He's Rutherford grade 1, category 3, Fontaine 2B. Uh, the patient's symptoms have been worsening despite medical therapy and an exercise program. He denies any rest pain or, ha or ischemic ulcers. Next slide, please. Uh, the patient's past medical history is significant for diabetes with neuropathy and hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He has a normal ejection fraction. Next slide, please. Uh, he is on appropriate medications, including aspirin and silostazole, as well as a statin, uh, lisinopril, uh, blood pressure medications, and insulin. He's a past smoker for 30 years and quit five years ago. Next slide, please. On examination, you can see his extremities exams reveals uh, uh, diminished left lower extremity pulses, one plus in the DP and PT, and normal right lower extremity pulses. Labs are all within normal limits. His ABIs reveal a right ABI of 1.22 and a left ABI of 0 0.68. Next slide, please. So this is his uh, angiogram. You can see that the iliac system is without uh, any significant disease. Next slide. On the left, you can see that the uh, osteal SFA is occluded. Uh, uh, that extends to the, essentially the distal portion. Next slide. There's distal reconstitution uh, of the SFA. Uh, the popliteal is without significant disease. Next slide. And here you can see below the knee, the AT has a high takeoff in the P3 segment, uh, and there is uh, diffuse disease in the mid-segment of the AT. Uh, the uh, PT and peroneal appear to be the dominant vessels and are, and are without significant disease. Next slide. Here you can see the mid to distal segment of the uh, uh, PT and peroneal uh, that are widely patent. And uh, you can see the diffuse disease in the distal AT. Next slide. And finally, at the level of the foot, you can see the PT... Uh, uh, in the foot uh, without disease. Next slide. So in summary, this is a 48-year-old male with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and previous tobacco use who now presents with severe left lower extremity claudication and abnormal ABI of 0.68. Uh, the peripheral angiogram reveals a CTO of the left SFA, and the plan is to do a left SFA intervention. PK? So, so Giancarlo, as, Thank you, you. as you can see, so this is how we keep it with a program, and we want bringing up some controversies in these type of cases. So the, this is a long diffuse SFA, and I want to just show you what we did offline. I know we have a phenomenal panel to talk about uh, what, what do you think is the best therapy for this patient. So as you can see, what, we had to first cross this lesion. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to take a picture of the proximal cap. So when we took a picture of the proximal cap, we have a, a collateral that comes off the proximal cap, making it a little bit more challenging. Uh, but clearly, there is a lot of calcium here. I don't know how it shows there. And you'll see the calcium as we go forward. So, so once, once we took a picture of the proximal cap, we immediately decided, okay, let's try to be intimal as much as possible. And we used a, a directional catheter. We used a directional catheter here. It's, it's, a, it's an aqua temporal catheter by Cordis, but you can use any particular catheter, JR4 or whatever it may be. And then what we decided to do was probe for the, for the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the takeoff without perforating the, uh, the collateral. So at this stage, we used a 014 coronary wire, actually. We went with a Confianza Pro wire, and, uh, uh, 12, and we went ahead and actually were able to uh, break through. But what really seemed to work better here was the Connect 250T. So then we were able, once we were able to get through this part, you can see the calcium as how it shows here. We were, we were then able to advance this wire uh, forward. So at this stage, we said, okay, it looks like we're within the calcium, so let's try to go with a, 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 a dedicated luminal device like the Viance device. So we went with the Viance device. For those of you, all of you know what it is. So when we went with the Viance device, you can see, there, there's the Viance device. You can see the Viance device is starting to slide very, very nicely, almost looking like it's intraluminal in the calcium. So we were very encouraged at this stage. So as we kept going... You can see uh, the Viance is following. You can see the level of calcium that this young man's uh, SFA has. You can see that the Viance seems to be heading in the right direction. But to cut to the chase and save time, we got subintimal, we thought, distally. So, so, so even though it was going smooth, we thought, okay, well, now what are we going to do? Then what happened was the wire 
we switched out for a Terumo gold wire, and the Terumo gold wire got into the collateral. So now at this stage, we were distal into the SFA collateral. So again, we were very encouraged that the dissection place was, was heading into the collateral. So at this stage, we were then, with, uh, with a little bit of luck and, and finesse, we were able to finesse the Terumo gold wire back in, and you can see a bunch of attempts here, back into the, uh, into the distal SFA, and then we did an IVIS. So, so I want to show the IVIS and then open it up to discussion. Uh, can you show the first IVIS, please? So this is the first IVIS distal to proximal. As you can see, we were intimal distal, and, and you can see we were very surprised, the three of us, because you know, it was not that difficult to get the viands all the way down, but you can see we're clearly, clearly in a, in a deep, and, well, I wouldn't say deep, in a subintimal plane. So, so as we come back, we, you can see two lumens in that spot, and you can see we've almost cored out the vessel, pushing all the, uh, uh, the, uh, the plaque to one side, and, and now you can see as we come all the way proximal, again, and again you're able to see that, uh, that the vessel is uh, dissected all the way down, even though we went with very, very small systems and not an 035 system. So at this stage, we're, we're, we're at the level of now, well, what do, what do we do uh, with this kind of patient? We have a long segment SFA with, uh, with, a, with a claudicon who's 48 years old. So one of, one of the things about not going to surgery at this stage is we felt we had, we had enough impressive data with uh, the DCB and the DES, uh, especially with the Cook Japanese, as well as with Supera, that, that we felt that we could probably give him, as long as we didn't burn a bridge to surgery, give him a therapy that may get him through, because with early PAD, you know, you may end up with having early CAD. So we've got all these things in mind, and we're just turning to the plant panel now for some advice on what they would do. So uh, do you have any comments, uh, Chris? Uh, or I will say a couple things. I don't know that this is calcified. Maybe on the IVIS is what maybe we thought to begin with. If I thought it was uh, subintimal, and I don't, I'm not sure you're subintimal the whole way there, quite honestly, but um, it would take me a little bit less out of atherectomy and more into starting with uh, preparation, DCB. If you get a good result with DCB, uh, then you may not need sending. If you do, then I would add uh, a stenting, and it would for me be either Supera uh, or Zilver PPX, but I think that's my thought pattern here. Is that uh, uh, I, I would probably not do atherectomy if I thought I was really subintimal. I don't see the calcium. Perhaps that we may have suspected from the end. Again. Yeah, let me let me show the calcium. <laughs> Can uh, your opinion as vascular surgeon? Sure. Yeah, this uh, this lesion, although it's a quite young man, although it's a long lesion, but it's still uh, open for an endovascular approach, as uh, PK mentioned. Uh, one condition if you don't burn the, bur the bridges for uh, future surgery. No. So I fully agree with this approach. In, in our case, in our country, uh, we don't have atherectomy reimbursed, so I definitely go there for a drug eluting stent, uh, the full, full segment of the SFA. So, so uh, the, the consensus seems to be a drug eluting stent, or uh, the question is why not DCB, why not a drug eluting balloon? So, uh, PK, this is Krishna. First of all, congratulations on getting through this uh, uh, long lesion. I, I'm surprised by um, the, the amount of calcium that you see under IVIS and the discrepancy which you see under uh, a fluoroscopy. I think that's an important guide. We always talk about intraluminal and luminal to luminal placement uh, with regards to the devices, and I think we don't really know the importance of okay. lumen to lumen versus subintimal passage. I think the point has been made at his. Uh, young age and trying to prefer, uh, uh, burn no bridges, you know, uh, nothing left behind was uh, initially uh, atherectomy, now it's mm -hmm. DCB. My favor here, and as you know, we appreciate your involvement in reality. Uh, this patient probably wouldn't probably get into reality because they may not have uh, severe enough calcium, but uh, I, I think uh, your approach here is, um, is, is spot on and uh, my, my hope would be that, you know, DCB with spot stenting uh, may be a good way to go. I assume he has three vessel runoff. So, Krishna, that's a, a great point. What I wanted to ask you was, was if you're going to do a DCB with, or the panel, would there be one particular DCB you do over the other at this stage? Or do you, are you guys feeling that all DCBs at this stage with the data out to one year uh, are created equal? Well, I, I, actually, I'm going to turn that question over to the one that probably has the most uh, experience on the panel, Professor Zeller, uh, as to if he was uh, understanding all of the adjudicated data out there, if he really has a preference of one 
uh, DCB under the circumstances versus another, and what data supports the opinion? Well, uh, based on, on science, we can only conclude that the impact would be the appropriate device because we have data for long lesions based on the impact global study. And that's the only study so far where we have any kind of peer-reviewed and independently adjudicated data about the performance of drug-coated balloons. For the other brands, we don't have data yet for long lesions. And this is mm -hmm. definitely a long lesion. It's a CTO. And all those kind of lesions had been evaluated within the impact global uh, uh, single arm study. So that would be, if, if, you, if you base your decision on science, then that's the only device you could choose here because for the other brands there is no, no, no published data yet available. That's number one. Number two is with regard to vessel preparation, um, we are not performing a lot of uh, laser interventions anymore in our institution, but I believe that would be a kind of debulking device which would be indicated here in this kind of lesion. <coughs> Even being subintimal, yeah. um, I believe that you would be able to remove some of the occlusive material um, without <coughs> uh, being at risk of harming the vessel, being in a subintimal space. So, um, Basically, in this young patient, I would have combined here laser with DCB. So, so Dr. Zell, as always, I, I cheated a little bit, and I didn't want to tell you everything we did. So what we did do was we, we, did, we did directional atherectomy. And let me tell you, I think you're absolutely right. I think laser would have probably may have been a better choice here. So when we did three passes with the directional atherectomy catheter, uh, uh, he, the, the, the patient experienced pain. This is just uh, running it through to see whether we have any areas where it gets caught up. But we did three passes with the directional atherectomy catheter, uh, the, 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 the silver, silver hawk, turbo hawk, long, long catheter. And what we found was that the patient started to having a lot of pain in the third pass. So, so at that stage, we did another IVUS. Can you play that IVUS, please? So we, we did another IVUS. And, and uh, I wanted you to see here, I know we, had, we did a lot of preparation offline just because of the time. And you can see here that, that, that we were able to create a lumen uh, a little bit better lumen, but again, you could see there's a tremendous amount of dissection flap, and now you have, you have two areas of, um, of, uh, of planes that I'm able to see on the IVUS. So at this stage, we knew, okay, he's having pain with directional atherectomy, possibly laser's a better choice here. I'm not certain, but, I, but uh, we have a lot of experience with directional atherectomy, we went with that. So now we decided to DCB following what Dr. Roka Singh was saying regarding um, you know, the, l some spot stenting. And you can also see we had some deep uh, injury of the, of the vessel wall there as well. So, so the issue here is, as far as spot staining is concerned, you know, the DCB of choice here w was, was a concern to us. And the second is, if you would spot stent, if you use the DCB, would you use a supera in the subintimal plane, knowing you're a subintimal, or would you go with a plain bare metal stent or another drug-coated stent? Well, um I would go with a, with a regular 19 old stent if you would need to use a stent uh, after drug-coated balloon angioplasty because the rationale for that is basically, number even if are. it's not very frequent, but we have seen oh. some positive remodeling it's in the safe. past following right. subinternal recanalization okay. procedures okay. with drug-coated balloons. And in particular, in this situation where you have used directional atherectomy, uh, creating some pain, um, there, you cannot completely exclude that you cut through the, through the vessel wall already. And this uh, would be some indicator for upcoming vessel enlargement. I, and if you would implant here superastent size one to one, uh, according to your uh, vessel uh, dimension, then it could happen that you will see malapposition over time. And using a regular 19 old stand would mean slightly oversizing the stand by one or two millimeters with a lower risk of uh, having this experience with uh, incomplete wall acquisition at six or 12 months. Okay. So because, I mean, we've done uh, subintimal supera standing in the past uh, after DCB. We ourselves here uh, haven't seen that happen, but clearly that's a, it makes sense from a, from a biologic basis uh, that, that, that that possibly could happen. Have you had experience with that actually happening on your patients, Dr. Zeller? Yeah, we, we are just collecting volume, a series please? of such cases, and uh, it's not that rare. And in particular, in subintimal uh, recanalization attempts. Right. Right. 
So, so as far as DCB choices here, we went with, uh, with the Lutonix uh, 150 DCB. So we're, we're using two, uh, two Lutonix DCBs in this particular case. Obviously, we are subintimal. The patient is having in pain. And we're very careful not to miss uh, have any geographic miss, um, as Dr. Guja made sure that uh, he was overlapping the DCBs by two. Mm -hmm. So I think once this DCB comes down, uh, we could take a picture, and then we can go ahead and, and see what, what the final therapy would be. Um, and, I'm, and, you know, uh, while we work, maybe for the, if, if, if it's going to take a little bit of time, we can go to a lecture and we can keep us on the side and, and watch what we're doing. But right now, we're, we just want to, obviously, with the DCB, one of the challenges is leaving, leaving this up. I want to ask the panel also in terms of, uh, you know, stenting with DCB. Is there any sense to use a Zilber PTX uh, in, these, in these lesions where you've done a DCB? You know, from Man, my point I, of view, uh, I, I see no reason unless you want to spend some more money. <laughs> um, uh, but, but frankly, I, I think you're bringing up some very important points uh, with regards uh, to a subintimal passage. One of the things that we're noticing in uh, the trial that you're involved in, in reality, um, we have histology. 100% of all histology extracted yeah. from the body is being analyzed. Uh, and we're seeing um, adventitia, and we're seeing elastic, uh, uh, external elastic lamina. One of, the, the th one of the concerns that has to be discussed and expressed here is deep wall injury and the placement of an antimitotic in deep wall and what that may do uh, to wound healing, if you will, and maybe promoting aneurysm formation. Although it's been rarely seen, we haven't really looked at it in a, met a methodological way. So those are one of the other things that we start having to think. Yeah. You're doing something that most doctors don't do here, and that's using IVIS to guide some of your decision making. That was not done in any of the global registries, and I think you're adding another layer of decision making that is very provocative. So, so Krishna, we, we're just going to walk the DCB out. We're going to take a picture, and uh, Giancarlo, just to see how this vessel looks. Uh, obviously, the patient has had pain, and we're always concerned uh, when we have a subindable injury like we've created in, in recall crossing this vessel. But we do have our bailouts available in the lab, such as covered stents um, and such. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to low magnification and show you a picture. I did not mention uh, that we did have a filter in place because we were doing directional atherectomy of a long segment. And Dr. Prashotham is going to go over that, uh, our paper that we published uh, recently in, in Jack Interventions about our algorithm for filter use. So you can see here that uh, with, the, with, the, with the picture, now that's just after DCB and, uh, and Silverhawk. Hey, you have a... a a very relevant uh, proximal uh, uh, dissection. Very relevant at the ostium, yes, and, absolutely. Uh, and it's a spiral dissection, and uh, probably you cannot solve the problem also with uh, a long inflation time. Distally, I would go back uh, with uh, a normal balloon and to inflate for 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. Approximately, approximately just. Uh, uh, to implant the short stand. So I'm going to show you the proximal here. Oh, sorry, sorry, so sorry. I'm going to just show you the proximal with the, with the lesion as I break Dr. Guja's leg. I apologize. But uh, you can see here that when you inject, there is a significant dissection up to the ostium. So, so the issue here would be now would you go with a bare metal or would you, would you put a silver PTX here? No, I would put a, a bare metal. I okay. I agree. Uh, I the I rest agree. of the panel? I wouldn't do either. Yeah, I might um, give it just for long even, time. Even, even if you have done already here a drug-coated balloon application, um, you could still go in with directional atherectomy and try to remove this dissection plane and to avoid stent placement here. Because you already mentioned this, this is a very young patient. And if you can achieve a result which is satisfying at the end without a stent, then you leave all the options for the future. and. Uh, Basically, I would do another uh, directional azerectomy run here. You, you can recheck the, the situation with IBIS. You can exactly uh, analyze the orientation of the dissection, and according to that, you can perform your directional azerectomy attempt here. I, I, I agree with you, Dr. Zeller, because if you could see, the rest of the vessel, like, even though, like Dr. Biamonino said, needs post-dilatation, I think overall it's a good-looking vessel, and if I cannot stent this, I'm going to be really, really happy. The, uh, you can see that the distal reconstitution zone looks quite good, even though it is definitely diseased. And here as well, I think with the help of the drug-coated balloon, we'll be okay. But the proximal area concerns me. 
So I know that I think we're, we're pretty much, do we have any more time to show this or? Because what well, we could do now you, is re this. Uh, you don't then, have any time anymore. Okay. <laughs> so then, then maybe you could put but, this up. Uh, you can go ahead and then show us later the final results. Huh? That's great. And, so, but before you do this, uh, this 30 seconds, uh, you can maybe show us the vessel in another plane. Okay, so, so yeah, I'm going to... Before you take a decision, huh? I, I suppose uh, the most important thing is to observe this dissection in different planes before you are too aggressive. So, so here's the uh, dissection in an in a RAO angulation. I showed you the LAO before. And here's the RAO angulation right there. Look at that. Uh, okay. Uh, up to you. I wouldn't go to with the, an atherectomy device there. Well, so we're going to IVIS. So I, I'll tell you what we're going to do. You can put us on the side. We're going to IVIS this and base our decision on the IVIS. And if it doesn't look uh, like a spiral dissection or, or a very deep wall on one side, then we, we may do atherectomy. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and stent and be done. So we'll just show you the final result in a few minutes. Okay. okay. Thanks so much uh, for this uh, great demonstration uh, again. Uh,